The Old Testament is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a singular narrative where every story and character points beyond itself to one who is greater. Jesus, the true and better prophet, priest, and king. Today we are looking at how Jesus is the true and better Joshua from Joshua 3, 14 to 17. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, and the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Uh, if you're new to Fellowship, my name is Greg Pinkner. I am the teaching pastor here at Fellowship, and I, uh, I find uh, myself this morning uh, deeply moved, um, because mostly because I cannot figure out which inappropriate joke to tell. <laughs> and I feel like I've failed you as a congregation, that at this moment... I don't have the perfect line. I've got too many perfect lines. That's the problem. Um, you know, I, this whole process has been uh, exhausting, training, exhilarating. I was hired uh, at Fellowship uh, basically three months after Rick had become the lead pastor. I attended Fellowship under the previous lead pastor, the, the man who planted this church. And so... To be here this Sunday after so many, after 20 years, um, brings me to a place of just reflection and, and joy. And it has been the worst 20 years of my life. And uh, um, but I, you know, if I could give you a piece of wisdom this morning, here's here's what I would tell you. Um, if you have an elder in your circle, or if you just want to reach out to one. Ask them about the last time they met uh, as they were making this decision and listen to the testimony each man has about the Holy Spirit entering the room and easing their minds and calling them to this. It is, my, the, the hairs on my arm stood up when I heard the story when they were telling us their decision. Um, uh, I, I can't say enough about RD. I can't. Um, I do have uh, several uh, gigs of outtakes from offstage that I'm going to blackmail him with, but <laughs> we'll, we'll get to all that later. This morning, we wanted to do something uh, a little normal, uh, and so we're just gonna have a Jesus True and Better sermon. Uh, and this morning, we're going to talk about Joshua. The first Sunday of the month is usually when we talk about the gospel. Joshua is one of my favorite imageries of Jesus in the Old Testament. And so if you have a Bible and you want to look, we'll be all over the place in Joshua 3. But let's set the stage in Joshua, right? Joshua is where Israel is going to enter the promised land. Um, it's going to enter the promised land and if you were here last week, we talked about the 10 plagues of Egypt and the start of the journey of Israel toward this promised land. So Joshua uh, brings us to this moment. So the stage in Joshua, uh, the leader who has led the people for, uh, of Israel for so long is now been told by God his time is over and he is dead on a mountain. Uh, so a younger, newer leader comes in can he do it? We don't know. We don't know. No one knows. Could anyone possibly know if this newer leader could possibly lead the people? If God's with him, yes. Otherwise, absolutely not. So it seemed apropos to pick this passage, right? Uh, uh, in fact, Moses had led the people out of Egypt, but along the way had... Uh, 
come to a place where he claimed credit for God's work. This is specifically uh, in Numbers 20. And then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. In fact, the New Testament says Moses struck the rock, and the rock was Christ. So we know this whole series of Moses and Joshua uh, is ordained by the Lord as an imagery of what Christ is going to do. Uh, and then the, Mo the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. So Moses uh, is... Uh, Cut off. He does not get to go in. In fact, uh, when the time comes, God leaves him up on a mountain and lets him look at the promised land. This is Deuteronomy 32. For you shall see the land before you, but you shall not go there into the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. So Moses is their leader, but Moses uh, becomes disqualified because claiming for himself the power of God. Uh, and God takes exception to that and says, well, you're not even gonna get to go in it. You can look at it. So then Joshua takes over, okay? Joshua takes over, and he is to lead the people into the promised land. Now, here is a map of uh, the promised land with some very specific things to note. So Israel has been wandering in the wilderness out here, right? And then they're gonna come up on this side of the Dead Sea and the Bible tells us they're going to cross the Jordan River, across the Jordan River right here to Jericho. Now, you know, we would say, well, why aren't you going up this way? It seems a lot easier, right? Uh, but the Lord never does things necessarily the easiest way. He does them in such a way to make sure we are constantly dependent on him, right? So he's gonna lead these people up uh, to the Jordan River here, they're gonna cross right across uh, from Jericho. And he tells the people, uh, this is how I want you to do it. I want you to get up in the morning and I want the priests uh, to take the Ark of the Covenant and walk in front of the people. This is Joshua 3.13, if you've got your Bibles open. Joshua 3.13. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bear, this is the Lord speaking to them. And when the Lord, uh, and when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the water coming down uh, from above shall stand up in one heap. So what's he saying? He's saying, I want you to carry the Ark of the Covenant for you. Now remember, go back to the Exodus. What happens in the Exodus? They're trapped. Pharaoh's army's coming. They don't know how they're gonna get away. The Lord parts the Red Sea. They walk across the Red Sea, and then they're delivered. Uh, and they go into the wilderness. They're going, look at what God just did. He just parted the sea so we could walk through it. And then they get to Mount Sinai, and Moses receives the law and then comes down to the people and says, these are the commandments that the law wants us to live under. The Lord wants us to live under. And they said, we will totally do it. And Moses is like, you're never gonna do it, right? And so they go to the promised land and then the people are like, those people are, they're like giants, right? This is an ancient people. So they're going, they're like giants. They're literally like 5'2". So we can't fight them. They're too big. And uh, God says, you didn't believe, you didn't trust me. I parted the sea for you and you didn't trust me so you don't get to go in. Nobody of that generation got to go in. So a whole generation had to pass away and then the people could enter to the promised land, which is where this moment. Now, they left Egypt, part the sea. This time God's saying, I'm gonna part the Jordan for you. It's kind of a bookend of parting things, right? It's a bookend of parting things. Uh, and so he says, when you win the feet of the priests, that are carrying the Ark of the Covenant into the water, I will pile it up in one giant heap. Uh, and so that's exactly, of course, what happens. Uh, the people begin, this is verse 14. So when the people set out from their tents, 
to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So this is not, uh, you know, little Jordan. This is big Jordan, right? It's flooded. Uh, sometimes you can see pictures of the Jordan River and go, oh yeah, it looks like a river. And then in other places, and I wanna be respectful, the Jordan River looks like a ditch. Like it is not giant, but it places it is. And this time of the year, it especially is. Um, it is overflowing its banks. It is filled to the, I mean, overflowing because it's, it's during uh, the spring, during the rain season, right? So they're going in. And as soon as the priest's feet touch the water of the Jordan River that's overflowed its bank, right, it parts. Uh, the waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zarenthan. And those flowing down uh, toward the Sea of the Arabath, right, the Salt Sea, this is the Dead Sea, were completely cut off and the people passed over opposite Jericho. So exactly what God says is exactly what God does. Israel starts its journey uh, through a powerful act of God destroying the gods of Egypt. If you were here last week and you heard that sermon, draw the connection. If you weren't, I would recommend you listen to it. Uh, the 10 plagues are direct refutations of the Egyptian gods. So he kills the Egyptians' idols and he says, follow me, and he miraculously delivers the people of Israel. But they don't. They almost immediately go back to making an idol for themselves, the golden calf, right? And then Moses goes, who's on the Lord's side? And some of the people of Israel say, we're on the Lord's side. And so then the first time we see his name, uh, I think it's the first time we see his name, uh, Moses tells Joshua, uh, who's a young man, I want you to get a sword, I want you to get people with you, and I want you to go kill everybody who's worshiping the false god. Because nobody else gets to go on this trip. Right? Uh, he's come down with the Ten Commandments. He's come down with the law. He's come down with how Israel is going to have to follow the Lord and he finds them worshiping a false god. So uh, in his vengeance, Moses uh, is directed to tell Joshua and the young men, the fighting men of Israel who had said, we will follow the Lord. Go and cut down everyone who worshiped a false god. They then go on the journey and fail. They still don't have faith enough to get into the promised land and so God says, okay, this whole generation's not gonna get to go. There's only two people that are gonna get to go, and that's Joshua and Caleb, the two, uh, the two guys who had kind of said, hey, we'll go and look, we'll spy for you, and say, the Lord will help us do this. So, uh, as usual, when we're going to do a true and better, we're going to show you the ways in which Old, Old Testament events prelude to the gospel right, and to Jesus specifically. So let's look through our four things that we were looking at. Number one, Moses uh, is the leader. Moses is disqualified. Joshua takes over, and then God gives them the promised land. Now, if uh, what is Moses? If you are going to be in the Old Testament and you are going to say, what is Moses most known for? Uh, we might say, well, the, the delivery of the 10 plagues and the Passover and those kind of things. And, and yeah, sure. But what Moses is emblematic, emblem something of uh, is the law. He is the lawgiver. Uh, in fact, when Jesus is transfigured, when he shines with the glory of God in front of the disciples, um, he meets with two men. He meets with, Moses, who is the emblem of the law, and he meets with Elijah, who is the emblem of the prophets. Uh, in Romans 3, when Paul is writing his magnum opus of the gospel, and he's ready to talk about the gospel, he says, but now a righteousness from God has been made known apart from the law. And then parentheses, although the law Moses and the prophets Elijah testify to it. 
You following me? Moses is the law. Uh, and Moses disobeys. And he cannot follow the Lord uh, to earn his way into the promised land uh, because the law cannot enter the promised land. He can't, he's not allowed to. Uh, if you've ever thought it was weird that Moses didn't get to go in. Like here's the guy that God picked to be his deliverer, but he's not allowed to go into the promised land. It always seemed kind of weird, right? Uh, because there's something deeper going on. Because there's something deeper going on here. If Moses is the emblem of the law, the law not being allowed to enter the promised land is the very centerpiece of legalism and the teaching against legalism in the New Testament. This is Galatians 2. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Justified is the actual biblical word for the word we always use, which is saved. Are you saved? What you really mean is are you justified? This is a Greek word that comes from the word righteousness. And this form of the word righteousness, justified, means have you been made righteous forever? Under the law, you can never say yes, not ever. Because there's always one more moment of the law that you might disobey. So you can never say you are forever justified. You can only say, I am just at this moment. I'm just right this second. And in fact, once you commit one sin, one, you can never be justified because you have been found guilty of breaking the law. What are the laws? Ten Commandments are easy, right? Don't have a God before me. Uh, don't break the Sabbath. You're going, well, I'm here on Sunday, so I'm good. Sabbath is on Saturday. Welcome to the club. Like, you broke it, right? You're like, I didn't break it. Yeah, you set up a, a tailgate yesterday at Nayland. You worked on the Sabbath, and then you worshiped a false god, a false idol. Like, I'm just kidding. So don't, don't come in here talking smack to me, right? Uh, do not lie. You ever lie? You ever told a lie? Anybody who says, I've never told a lie, just told one, welcome. Do not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? People are like, I've never stolen anything. Do you have a brother or sister? Yes, you've stolen everything. <laughs> you've stolen so much stuff, right? Uh, do not commit adultery. But in the, New, in the New Testament, Jesus says that do not commit adultery goes all the way to do not look lustfully at someone. And well, you're all... Uh, <laughs> I've made that joke for a long time at this church, and I can't tell you how much the laughter hurts each time. <laughs> it's not like the girls at my middle school didn't make it perfectly clear. But... <laughs> right? Somebody's really laughing over there, and that was not cool. Uh, so the law cannot enter the promised land. It cannot, so what does the New Testament say? The New Testament says you need uh, a savior, a perfect savior to lead you into the promised land. We have one, his name's Jesus, right? Wrong. Jesus' name is not Jesus. Jesus is what you get if you have a Hebrew name that you turn into Greek and then you turn into Latin and then you turn into German and then you turn it into English. That's Jesus. Jesus' Hebrew name, it means the Lord saves. That's what his actual Hebrew name is. The Lord saves. And in English, that name is Joshua. Jesus' name was Yeshua, Joshua, the same name that Joshua has. The Lord saves. So Jesus has to take over. He has to take over for us. Does the story tell us that, okay? Uh, when the soul of the feet of the priest bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the earth, the ark of the covenant, right? The Nazi face melter from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Listen, I wanna tell you guys something. Some of our younger staff came to me the last time I made my Nazi face melting joke and they went, you gotta stop telling that joke. Not everyone gets that joke. And I go, 
only people who matter get that joke. <laughs> So if you're Gen Z and you're going, I don't get that joke, I need you to look at my face. Look at my face. I don't care. <laughs> I will never care, okay? So, but what really is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was the actual presence of God. It's in the tabernacle. It's in the temple. No one could look at it or touch it. If you touched it, you died instantly because it was the presence of the Lord. Uh, one day a year, the high priest would walk into the Holy of Holies. You ever heard of that? That's where this was. One day a year, by the blood of a spotless uh, sacrifice, they would walk into the, the, the room of the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and on one day a year, he would come and ask the Lord to forgive the sins of Israel from the past year for the year going forward, and he would pour blood in between those angels. And that was the place of atonement. Uh, the Hilasterion. Uh, Paul, in Romans 3, calls Jesus the Hilasterion the living place where sacrifice is made, right? So when the presence of God who will make sacrifice with blood, you follow me? Uh, enters the Ark of the, this, that's the Ark of the Covenant. When the living presence of God who will by blood make sacrifice for the people enters the Jordan River, that is when Israel is allowed to enter. What's interesting to me is that this place that Israel crossed, right, right near Jericho, is very near Bethany beyond the Jordan, where Jesus is baptized. You following me? Where Jesus is baptized. The geography of Israel tells a story. Sea of Galilee, right? The Romans called it the Sea of Tiberias. By Jesus' time, uh, it was... Uh, if you lived in the north, uh, unless you lived in the 10 Greek cities right around the Sea of Galilee, you were kind of considered a hick because this is where all the farmland was, right? Fresh water, a giant freshwater lake in ancient times, you can imagine, is where all the life is. This place is arid and dead. The Dead Sea was literally considered where Sodom and Gomorrah was. So the Israelites have a story they tell that the Sea of Jordan was literally considered the judgment of God, life to death. When they baptized people, they baptized them in the Jordan River so that their sins could flow away from them into the death and destruction of the Salt Sea, of the Sea of the Curse. Are you following me? Uh, you don't have to go far from this to understand this. Uh, Sam Houston, when he became a Christian, was baptized. They said, your sins have been washed away. He said, God, please save those fish too. Like that was his statement of being baptized. His sins have been washed away. Now follow the imagery here. Moses can't get you in. The law cannot get you in. You cannot be good enough to make it through judgment. I jokingly stood up here and talked through the Ten Commandments, and every, it was funny, and we laugh, but every single one of us is guilty of so many sins. And that is, I mean, count what Jesus said was the greatest and most important commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your height, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And if you stop for a minute and think about those requirements, the reality is, is every single thing you've ever done in your whole life was a sin. Every single second. Because can you name any moment where you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength? One moment of your life. You'd be a fool to say yes. So even when we're doing our best, we're still sinning in some ways. Because even if we are doing our very best thing, we're going, God, oh, my feet hurt. Well, that wasn't all your mind. You following me? We're not just guilty of sin. We're guilty of being completely sinful. 
how can we make it through judgment? Let alone that we would all admit we've told a lie before, right? A perfect savior. A place where the person and living testimony of God meets blood and meets sacrifice and meets atonement. The hilasterion in the New Testament is often translated propitiation. What is propitiation? Propitiation is an offering that takes away the sin and all the consequences of the sin, right? An expiation is an offering that takes away the debt, but not all the consequences. A propitiation means it's like it never happened. Well, that's not in that text, is it? Well, God gives us the promised land, right? There's a little fact here we need to go back to. Uh, so the people set out their tents in the morning to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the presence of God and of blood and of sacrifice and of atonement were dipped into the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. So it's not just the river of judgment. It's when judgment is its most powerful. It is filled. Nothing can escape it because it is at flood stage. The water's coming down. Oh, excuse me. Uh, now, the, the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of the harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam. If you look at this map, you'll notice where Adam is all the way up here. It's almost like when the presence of God comes into judgment right before damnation. That judgment goes all the way back to Adam like it never happened. Amen? You better say amen. I'll keep going. <laughs> Jesus is a true and better Joshua. Moses cannot lead you into the promised land. You can't be good enough. You need heaven as a gift. You need heaven given to you by a man whose name is, no, 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 no. The Lord saves. I'll do it for you. And you will trust me by your faith in me that I can do this. And by my grace, I will bring you to the promised land. Let's pray together.